Hello and a warm welcome to Talking Stocks. I am Kukule Tukele. In studio with me is Sean Ashton and David Gibb, both from Anchor Capital. Now today we're talking GlaxoSmithKline, a British pharmaceutical company headquartered in London. Established in 2000 by a merger of Glaxo Wellcome and SmithKline Beecham, the company was the world's sixth largest pharmaceutical firm as of 2015. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us on this, a company that potentially touches a lot of lives uh, across the globe. 2015, as we alluded to, quite an interesting year when it comes to the dynamics and uh, the performance of the company. Maybe let's kick off there before getting an overview. David, your thoughts on uh, the declining profits but also increased sales in uh, some of their drug divisions? Yes. So Glaxo has been in a difficult place for many years now. They haven't had a strong portfolio of new products coming through. So their, their older products have been in decline through generic competition or just price competition in the US. And for the first time last year, we've seen some of this new portfolio kicking in of new products, particularly last year with some new HIV products. Mm -hmm. And so what we're seeing is that we're seeing the early signs of a turnaround in the sales situation for, for Glaxo. So after many, many years of frustration from investors in the UK and globally, and frustration from the UK public, because Glaxo has been a venerable uh, business in, in the UK and has, has almost led the pharmaceutical industry in the UK for, for many years. Um, but it has been tarnished because it hasn't come up with enough new products. Mm, is that where things went wrong? Because this is quite a large company uh, and from a multiple perspective, this is how a does it compare? This is a typical issue with large pharmaceutical companies is that once you've got an established base of drugs, you put significant R&D behind uh, drugs, new, new drug, drug discoveries. And what tends to happen is you earn, uh, I would argue, super profits on those drugs. Um, but you have a patent period that is typically 20 years in, in duration and when that patent expires uh, you have generic competition that comes in that prices their drugs at, at, at a very low price relative to the originator. Mm. Um, so if you, if you don't have a new pipeline of drugs coming through to replace lost revenues that falls off when you, when you lose your patents, uh, you tend to find that these things stagnate. And a case in point was Pfizer a number of years ago where um, where their cholesterol drug Lipitor came off patent and I think they lost something like 80% of their revenues of that specific drug over a, a couple of years. Sure. So it can be quite devastating and I think you know, th th that's been the issue of Glaxo in recent years is that they haven't been very acquisitive uh, to, to try and bolster earnings growth that way but at the same time they've had this continual bleed out of, of revenue from, uh, from the existing portfolio with, with a pipeline that hasn't really replaced it. But as David says now uh, for the first time in a number of years, you're starting to see some real evidence of, uh, of a reasonably firm pipeline over the next couple of years. Let's touch on the growth prospects and the turnaround strategy for 2016 from an EPS perspective, uh, together with new products that could potentially be launched this year. Right, so they are guiding to double-digit earnings growth in constant currency terms this year. First time we would have seen that in many, many years. Mm. And they've also got some tailwinds from the currency. So they report in, in British pounds. So from the bottom line, they would say that the tailwinds will add another 5%. So you might get up to 15% earnings growth this year from Glaxo, which, which, which would be new. And, and frankly, I think the market is slightly disbelieving because they've had to wait so long. So it's one of those things where the market sentiment on a company like this is still relatively poor and it'll take a while before it catches up with, you know, good earnings or good revenues if they do come through. Just to uh, interject there for a moment, uh, wouldn't we see the market really rewarding them quite significantly? Because it does seem as though with the ongoing volatility and subdued outlook on many companies, if you disappoint, the market punishes you. But if you uh, manage to yes. impress ever so slightly, uh, you get rewarded significantly. Absolutely. Expectations are quite low, which can be a good thing if they, if they manage to deliver on what they're saying. Because as David says, expectations are, are, are implying that they're, that they're going to fall short. Mm -hmm. um, but I think from a valuation point of view, it's, it's pretty attractive at a forward 16 and a half odd P multiple and, and also they've been fairly generous with their dividend policy so the, the, there's a special in the mix uh, but also they're, they're going to pay about 80 cents of, of ordinary dividend 80 pence of ordinary dividends this year which translates into about a five and a half percent yield so you're quite well paid to uh, to be fairly patient with this one I would say. Mm -hmm. Let's touch on some of the new products being launched and uh, we do have a graph uh, showing uh, the uh, growth projections there but also Advair and Serotite if I'm yes. pronouncing it correctly. That's where yes. the growth opportunities are, right? Well, those are, that is their traditional, that's been their biggest product now for many years. So 
Historically, Glaxo was always strong in respiratory areas, so particularly things like asthma. So uh, Advair and Serotide are about 15% of total sales. Um, and those, those sales have been declining now for the last few years. Um, and they are expecting them to continue to decline this year by another 20%. Mm. But what we have got now is they've introduced new products into their respiratory portfolio, which are taking a while but are gradually now coming through. And if you combine those new products with their new HIV products, we're finding that the new products are now offsetting the losses from the decline in Serotide and Advair. Serotide and Advair, by the way, it's the same product. It's just the one has got a different, is the one is for the, U, the US is Advair, Serotide is for, is, is for Europe ah. and the rest of the world. On, on the topic though of uh, new innovations, wouldn't investors be concerned about the amount of investment and capex that needs to go into research and development? Wouldn't that I offset think that's, some of I the I think that's prospects? an ongoing part of the business model. I don't think that's going to be necessary, uh, provided you're seeing returns from it. So you, you ultimately do want to see revenue coming through. I'd be very concerned about a pharma company that wasn't committing capital to, to R&D because then you know that that business is ultimately going to die mm -hmm. um, uh, as a result of a lack of new products coming through. So I think I think the, the extent to which they're investing, provided you see revenue coming through from new products, that, that's a good thing. And I think yeah, the, the evidence that we're starting to see now, if you look at the, um, the 11 new products that they, that they talk about, that was something of the order of 600 million pounds worth of incremental revenue in 2014, 2 billion pounds in 2015, and it looks like it could be as much as 3 billion pounds next year. Uh, so well, by 2020, this, year, 2016. this could be a completely so, different company. So, uh, and in the context of a business where your top line is about 20 odd billion pounds or so, you, know, that's, you can see that that's starting to plug the gap from old products that are, that are in a declining phase. Mm. What about the geographical spread of this company? You mentioned Stronghold within the US together with the UK, but uh, are there international exposures? They, working they do have a strong international exposure. I mean, for example, in South Africa, Glaxo is well represented. In fact, Andrew Whitty was head of Glaxo South Africa. For, for a while too. So th they have taken an approach, um, you know, they're strong in India in their consumer business. They do have three legs to their business. The farmer, which is about 60% of, of sales. Then they've got a consumer business and then they have a, a, a vaccine business. Mm -hmm. um, but the consumer business, for example, in India, Horlicks is a big product of theirs. Um, uh, they have things like Sensodyne in their consumer division as well. So they have a, a nice spread, which Andrew Whitty has been quite good at building this balanced portfolio. So it also reduces the risk, not just only having a pharma division. So they've built up the vaccine and consumer, and, and that is represented in many countries in the world. Mm. On this outlook, though, and the pipeline going forward for the retail South African investor, well, the, probably, the closest comparison will probably be Aspen, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, uh, if we do have to compare the two, uh, would there be any means of uh, providing some kind of comparison regarding? So, the so I think I mean Aspen's a very relevant example because GSK has been an investor in Aspen, and they've actually been divesting of their stake. If I'm correct in saying it, they're down to about two percent or so holding in sure. Aspen. So they've had a a fairly material holding in, in, in Aspen f uh, uh, over the last number of years. And Aspen has actually purchased a number of products from them uh, to bolster their own portfolio in, in South Africa and the rest of the world. But I think if, if I was to con compare the, the two companies, Aspen is also very much a global business, nowhere near as large as, as what GSK is. Uh, but their exposure tends to be a lot more into the emerging market space rather than having a huge, I mean, like if you see uh, GSK has got 34% of their revenue from the States. From the United States, That's you know, Aspen job. clearly is, is more LATAM focused, uh, and 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 the rest of the world. Um, I think from from the perspective of valuation, historically they've been quite different. Um, so Aspen has been, and their business model has been very different. They're they're not really an, an originator of new product, so their R and D spend will tend to be quite low. Um, their their kind of core strategy over the years, if you look at how they've developed their business and grown their business and grown their profits, at least 50% of their profit growth, I would estimate, over the last 10 years has been through acquisitions, both companies and products, where they might buy for, from GSK, for example, an off-patent off product, mm -hmm. which is not receiving very much sales attention in a particular geography. And, and these guys believe that if they can combine it with their existing basket and market it better, they'll have a better outcome for, for that particular product. So they've actually purchased 
a number of off patent products from GSK at fairly low multiples, talking you know seven to eight times PEs, mm -hmm. and they funded it both through the issue of paper and uh, and and debt. And as a result, they've they've de developed quite a lot, of, quite a nice pipeline of growth. Mm -hmm. um, so so Aspen's a far more acquisitive company. I think the issues that they're facing now are, are currency related in the sense that they've got a lot of emerging market exposure in their turnover line, yet they've got dollar debt and dollar costs in the form of ingredients that go into making drugs. Sure. So they're experiencing a bit of a margin squeeze right now. Um, it was a very expensive stock, mm -hmm. got up to more than double the rating of the, of, of the market and now you're down to uh, probably a forward 20, 22 PE, which is about a 10% premium to the broader index. Um, so I think you know, Aspen's got some short-term headwinds which has taken the wind out of their sails from a valuation point of view. So that one might be looking more interesting now as well. Exactly. Well, let's get the view from uh, analysts here today. Uh, buy, hold or sell GSK. David, let's start with you. Buy, hold or sell uh, GSK. So I've been buying this share. It's the second largest holding in the Anchor BCI Worldwide Flexible Fund. Sure. So it's now um, at around 5.5% of my fund. And I've started, you know, over the last several months when I've noticed that, um, that their new product pipeline was now beginning to kick in in the revenue line, I, I have been adding up. So I've, I've built up a fairly big stake here. Mm. What I am watching is is the launch potentially by Mylan of a generic for Advair and Serotide. It's a difficult uh, drug to copy, but they have filed with the FDA in December, this last December, and they might launch sometime next year, but it, it's a difficult one to copy. And frankly, the market has been open to generic competition for a while, and we haven't seen a product yet. So, but I'm, I'm watching the Mylan product. But, you know, if the new product sales come through strongly, then the, the, the Mylan risk does, uh, does fade away. Mm -hmm. Sean, your view? I'm probably a little bit more on the fence. For me, it looks like a hold. I, I like the valuation. Um, so for less than 20 is reasonable for a business that's been generating a 50% return on equity that throws off the amount of cash that it does and it's giving you a 5.5% dividend yield. So in the yield-starved world, which I think, is, I think is what we're in and what we're likely to remain in for some time, that looks quite attractive. I think exactly what Dave's just mentioned now, what, what I'm a little bit nervous about is, is whether or not Mylan's product launched to, to compete with Advair is very successful or not. Because uh, whilst they're seeing a 20% decline year on year in, in the revenues of Advair now, um, if, if you do have a new competitor that's priced right, that, that actually has got the same level of e efficacy as that particular drug, you know, history says you can see devastating results uh, sure. for, for the originator drug. The example I used earlier of Lipitor that you know, their sales came off 80%. I, I think this is a bit different in the sense that it's not as if we haven't had time for um, new competitors to come in. We have, um, but, uh, but if they're successful there, it can damage their business a bit. And it is 15% of sales, so I'd like to watch that, but I think uh, the news flow is becoming more positive. Mm -hmm. So for ho hold for me hold and uh, a buy from David there. Well, we'll leave it there for today. A uh, positive outlook, though, coming through for uh, GlaxoSmithKline for 2016. Hopefully, uh, new products will uh, participate quite actively in the increased profits of the company. But that's where we leave it for today. A big thank you to both my guests, Sean Ashton and David Gibb from Anchor Capital. We'll speak to you again next week at the same time where we talk more stocks.